dust fire requires fuel, oxygen, and an ignition source. A dust explosion requires two additional elements, dispersion and confinement. The CSB commissioned laboratory tests using a sample of fine polyethylene dust found by investigators in the rubble of a North Carolina factory. Dust is dispersed into a flame, creating a fireball. When the dust is confined within a structure or a piece of equipment, a powerful explosion can occur and propagate, as this coal industry video demonstrates. Dust may accumulate on surfaces and lie undisturbed for years. Then some initial fire or explosion, known as a primary event, shakes it loose and ignites it. It causes a pressure wave to go through the plant, and that dislodges all of the dust that is perhaps unknown up on the rafters, on the beams, on the tops of equipment, and that serves as the fuel for the secondary explosions that move through the plant. Most of the fatalities and the devastating injuries have been caused by these secondary dust explosions. According to the NFPA, a catastrophic explosion can occur from as little as one thirty-second of an inch of accumulated dust around the thickness of a dime, covering just 5% of a room's surface area. The NFPA therefore recommends that companies control fugitive dust emissions, design facilities to prevent dust from migrating and accumulating, and perform rigorous housekeeping to remove any dust that does build up. The NFPA codes have been adopted either at the state level or in some cases at the local level, at the city level. But the problem is they're not enforced in any regular way. A catastrophic dust explosion at the West Pharmaceutical Plant in Kinston, North Carolina in 2003 reveals what can happen when companies do not properly assess the hazards from combustible powders and do not design their buildings and equipment appropriately. West Pharmaceutical made small rubber medical products, such as syringe plungers and stoppers, at a large manufacturing facility with nearly 300 workers. In the process, large batches of rubber were compounded and rolled into long strips. To keep these strips from sticking together, they were dipped in a vat containing a whitish slurry of water and finely powdered polyethylene, a petroleum-based wax-like plastic. The coated rubber strips were then blown dry with fans and folded for later processing. As the rubber sheets dried, combustible polyethylene dust, which was not visible to workers but is colored white here for illustration, was blown into the air. Over the years, the air conditioning system drew polyethylene dust into the hidden space above an acoustic tile ceiling that was suspended over the production area. There, the dust gradually built up to a thickness of up to one half inch on ceiling tiles, beams, conduits, and light fixtures, just a few feet over the heads of unsuspecting workers. January 29th began as a routine workday at the West Plant, but at about 1.28 p.m., a small fire or explosion occurred somewhere near the production area. It lofted the accumulated dust above the ceiling into a thick cloud, which then ignited in a much more violent secondary explosion. Some employees described a sound like rolling thunder as the dust explosion spread throughout the space above the ceiling and ripped through the building. The accident at West Pharmaceutical Services took the lives of six employees and injured 38 others, including two firefighters. The thing that set up the tragedy at West was the mere accumulation of hazardous dust above a ceiling. The NFPA code says that any openings where dust could accumulate must be sealed. The solution would have been to either seal it or to not have a suspended ceiling. Another cause of the West accident was that workers were not informed of the dust explosion hazard arising from the polyethylene slurry, a fact that should have been included on the material safety data sheet. 
at West Pharmaceutical, the dust wasn't well recognized as a hazard because it was actually in a slurry form. So the actual processing of the slurry, the drying of it, created the dust, and the dust migrated above the suspended ceiling. Cleaning above the ceiling was overlooked in West's otherwise rigorous housekeeping program. Cleanliness was a matter of pride for the West staff. Being in the pharmaceutical services industry, they kept the production area very, very clean. Some of them knew that large amounts of dust had accumulated above the suspended ceiling. Had they been aware that that was an explosive material, they could have informed management of the accumulation and perhaps the situation could have been rectified before the explosion. Jim Don is a leading expert on combustible dust. If you got a dust, you need to know what the ability of that dust is to explode. And to be able to characterize that dust in terms of, does it take a little energy? Does it take a lot of energy to ignite it? Uh, will this dust, when it explodes, create a very major overpressure? Those are the things that need to be on to a MSDS. The CSB found that the problem of inadequate MSDSs is widespread. Of 140 MSDSs for combustible powders, the CSB found that very few included adequate dust explosion warnings or referred readers to the appropriate NFPA.